Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. I'm Otto, and I am an alcoholic. <laughs> glad to be here with you. Glad to be sober. Uh, I want to start off by mentioning one thing, and... Uh, we were looking forward to uh, spending this weekend with Joyce uh, and her husband. And uh, Joyce was your Al-Anon sp- speaker, or to be your Al-Anon speaker. And uh, she was killed about three weeks ago by, uh, by a drunk. And uh, so uh, they, won't, they won't be here. Uh, so uh, sometime during the weekend... Uh, uh, send out a prayer to him because uh, he's. I talked to him this week, Clarence, and he's waiting for his wife to come home. You know, so anyhow, uh, that's done. Uh, I, I, I'm not a teacher in Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, I'm an example. I hope uh, try to be a good example. Maybe not always. Uh, sometimes, I, but I always try to be a sober example. My sobriety date is August the 20th of 1959. And so thank you. And that is because of you and uh, a lot of people that came before you. Uh, my wife, uh, Mary Ann, we're partners in this deal. And uh, she asked me uh, a, little, a little while ago uh, whether I was up to this or not. And... Uh, and I said, well, I just, I trust God and I trust you people. And <laughs> I just head on out. That's the way I do it, you know. And, uh, I'm glad you mentioned old Joe Leach. Uh, uh, Joe and I were buddies for many years. And although I, I was never a railroad man, uh, we had a lot of similar experiences, uh, because I was a wino too. I came by it, uh, my heritage, honorably, I want you to know. I come from a long line of drunks, you know. Uh, both my parents took it all the way out. And uh, my mother was, uh, my mother came from Ireland. And uh, and in looking at my family history in Ireland, there were a lot of premature deaths. Uh, my grandfather died at 48 years old from mysterious causes, <laughs> you know. <laughs> And uh, and the Murphy boys were all drunks. Uh, they all died drunk. They never found this deal. And my dad uh, came from Switzerland in 1923 at Ellis Island and uh, knew how to stomp grapes. He was a winemaker. And and uh, so I come by being a wino uh, legitimately, really. Uh I think I, I was a, a, an alcoholic from the very beginning. I don't ever remember in my whole life saying things like, uh, oh, no, thank you, I've had enough. <laughs> or uh, I'm beginning to feel it, you know. <laughs> Shit, if I hadn't felt it, I wouldn't have drank it. <laughs> so I remember being, uh, and, and you know, this is kind of a thread strung throughout our society uh, I remember being a lonely little frightened kid, uh, feeling uh, out of place and uh, trying to fit in feebly, really, most of the time. So I uh, uh, I just got tough, you know. We moved a lot. And uh, and so uh, I would come home from school and the, and the boxes were being packed, you know, cardboard boxes and we were off and running again. And, uh, and so, uh, at about age 14, I'd ran it up. And, uh, that's when I first came in contact with booze. And, uh, I was up, uh, I had, I'd had drinks before, you know, sitting around, a sip here, a sip there. But I'd never really, you know, tied one on. And I was working the farms up in British Columbia. And, uh, at 14, uh, this was during, uh, the second world war and all the young guys were off fighting. And, and so the farms were left to the old guys and, and kids like me. 
And, uh, and the old boys, uh, we worked hard. We worked long hours. Some of you here are farmers. You know that. We were up at four in the morning and on the tractors and, uh, and, uh, and we worked six days a week. And uh, Sunday was, uh, was a day that we could uh, have off. And, uh, and so, uh, what we do, uh, in the closest town was, uh, uh, they had a blue law, no booze on Sunday. But there was a town called Puscape, which is about 23 miles away. And, and, uh, we'd all head over there on Sunday and, and buy booze and, well, we did, well, we could buy booze, 14 then, you know. They had cards up there. They had to have a card to have, to buy booze, you know. Shut up, my dog had a card. <laughs> you know, uh, we had plenty of cards, no shortage of cards. Uh, so, uh, what we'd do, we'd, we'd get, uh, load the pickup truck or a flatbed, whatever the hell we had, and, and, uh, uh, go on down to the creek. They had a place down by the creek. And we all drank, and the fight started about a half hour into the deal, usually, you know. And uh, and uh, the old boys would beat the shit out of us kids and throw us in the back of the pickup trucks and, and haul us back, and we were on the tractors at 4 o'clock in the morning. But I'll tell you what, I found something in uh, in that deal. I found what booze would do for me. God, it's wonderful shit. That's why I followed it so close for so many years, you know. God, it, it, uh, I'll tell you what it did for me. Uh, I was a square peg trying to fit in a round hole of life. And what it did, it rounded my corners off. Shit, I, zippo, right in there. Christ, I could talk to girls. I could dance pretty good, you know, sometimes even with a girl. <laughs> and, uh, couldn't fight worth a damn though, drunk. <laughs> Jesus, <laughs> you know. But I was to follow that. And every time I drank, I, I got drunk. Now, in the, in my early drinking, my bounce back ability was there. You know how that is. You remember. Shit, drink all night and get up and go to work. You know, get an hour of sleep, maybe. Take a shower and go to work. You know. And, uh, and if you're working with, uh, people that did that, hell, they didn't think anything of it. I did that a lot. In fact, uh, I was to follow that quite a ways. I loved what booze did for me in the beginning. But right away there were problems. And it was a matter of balance. Pretty soon the problems outweighed everything. <laughs> I went into service at, uh, as soon as I could. And, and it wasn't really to get out of trouble or anything like that. It's just that, uh, I, I was just running. And, uh, I ended up in Alaska. At 17 years old and the service. And, uh, Alaska's a hell of a good place to drink. Uh, Fourth Avenue in Anchorage was one big bar. And shit, we'd just see how far down the avenue we could go. And, uh, drunk every, every night, but at work every day. And then, then pretty soon the progression of alcoholism, uh, cut in. And, uh, I was, I came back to the States and, uh, and I went to school uh, in the Army, and I went to Fort Bragg, North Carolina. And I was at uh, at Fort Bragg, North Carolina uh, in June of 1950 uh, when, uh, actually I was home on leave, but I got a telegram uh, that said, uh, report immediately, do not bring family or car. <laughs> the, the Koreans had just uh, decided to go south. And, uh, and so uh, I knew what that meant. So I went on back there, and my battalion was shipped out to Korea. And I spent uh, the next uh, 18 months, really, in Korea, off and on. I got sent to Japan a few times uh, to get patched up. But uh, I, uh, I ended up uh, uh, drunk all the time. And, 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 you know, I have buddies of mine. Uh, I got one buddy in Minnesota, and he drank right with me. But uh, but he's not an alcoholic. He's not an alcoholic, and he came back and fit right into life. And uh, I came back and I wasn't worth the shit. <laughs> I didn't fit in anywhere. And uh, they tried to fit me in. Uh, I got out of the hospital and and uh, and they tried to give me different assignments and uh, 
and I, I, by this time I couldn't show up. Uh, I was meant to, but I'd have one drink and I was off and running. And I never knew how far or how long. And, uh, and what happened to me was they, they finally, uh, put me on an island one and a half miles by six miles. And you would think that, uh, you can't get into very much trouble on an island one and a half miles by six miles. I'm here to tell you, you can get in one hell of a lot of trouble on an island one and a half miles, six miles. My, uh, my commanding officer was a drunk worse than me. And, uh, and I went in, I opened up a bar, which was a hell of a good idea at the time. And we were in the British West Indies. We were supposed to be tracking missiles, but, uh, actually we were tracking Canadian club. <laughs> and, uh, I, I got into, uh, I got into a business there, kind of by accident. They called, they called it an entrepreneur, really. Uh, the government called it smuggling, but I, I, I called it entrepreneurship. And, uh, I won't uh, get bore you with the details of it, but, uh, I got into it with a, a bird colonel, and, uh, it wasn't pleasant. I threatened him. And then, uh, I decided to uh, go to Africa, and I threw a couple of cases of whiskey aboard this 18-foot boat and headed out from the British West Indies to Africa, which isn't a hell of a good idea. <laughs> uh, I had uh, cloud coverage for uh, a few days out there bobbing around. I didn't have a compass. Uh, <laughs> But who cares? <laughs> uh, I'd fall out of the boat every once in a while. That's, that's why you never tie a tiller down on a sailboat, is because if you fall out, it slowly just turns into the wind and starts to flutter. If you tie the tiller down, it keeps going. And so I'd fall out every once in a while and, uh, and uh, climb back in the boat, take a drink of whiskey, and off I'd run. And, and about uh, the second or third day out, I don't know how long it was, but uh, uh, I heard this uh, airplane. It was an SA-16, and uh, and uh, I didn't have cloud coverage, and they spotted me. And they landed that uh, aircraft, and uh, they told me to take down my sail, and I gave them the finger, and and uh, they taxied up along, so the blades were getting kind of close, and uh, and. Uh, so this uh, guy came at me, and I nailed him, and he went into the water, and the next guy took me into the water, and they, the big capture was over r relatively quick. <laughs> they were a little bit upset with me, I might add, and they weren't too gentle when they threw me in the back of that uh, plane and flew me into uh, Florida. And that was my first experience at being sobered up. I had gotten sober lots of times. All of us have. But this was uh, four points on a hospital bed with an IV in my arm. And uh, by this time, I was in pretty tough shape, you know. I never drank, uh, I never drank an eight. I always just drank. And, uh, and I was down to about, uh, oh, probably 125 pounds or so. I weigh 200. I, I put on a little weight. Growing on the program, it's called. <laughs> and, uh, they took me up there, and this doctor uh, gave me a choice. He said, uh, Otto, you can either go back down to uh, the island and face the music. And I knew what the music was. It was a death march, you know, because they were building a gallows down there to hang me. Or, he said, you can go up to uh, Maxwell Air Force Base, Alabama, and undergo neuropsychiatric observation. And I looked him right in the eye, and I said, you know, Doc, there might be something wrong. And I thought there was with him. <laughs> he had given me the biggest hole to climb through that I had seen in a long time. And so I went up there to Ward 29, which was uh, I was going to get used to these kinds of places. It had a 20-foot fence around it with barbed wire on the top. And uh, it had an uh, architectural defect. Uh, there weren't any doorknobs on the doors. <laughs> and uh, 
and we started this uh, siege of uh, do you love your mother or would you rather go fishing kind of questions. <laughs> and, uh, and I didn't want to do either, really, you know. So... And they came up with a diagnosis. Uh, first diagnosis, chronic alcoholism. And the second diagnosis, which I really detested, was uh, emotionally immature. <laughs> Son of a... I said, uh, did, have you read my record? He said, oh, yeah. <laughs> And uh, then he let me read it. So. so they tried to get me to go back to duty. Uh, but uh, I didn't make it. I never made it back to duty out of that place. They honorably discharged me because of, I had a good record. I had, uh, I had some physical difficulties as a result of frostbite in Korea and the shrapnel. So they let me out honorably, and uh, and I went to the went home to mother and dad. Jesus, they loved it. <laughs> oh God, some of you who parents who know what I mean, having a drunk son come home, and uh, they moved me out in stages. God, that was funny. Uh, <laughs> they uh, they let me stay in the house for a while. And I went back to college and uh, did relatively well for a while, you know. I mean, I had a lot of fun drinking, and one of the gals in the chemistry uh, class that I was in was a stripper over at the Lake Club, and we all ended up over there all the time, you know, and doing our homework. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and eventually, you know, uh, classes got less attendance, and the bars got more attendance, and uh, pretty soon I dropped out of college. And uh, my folks decided that it was time that uh, I moved out, because uh, they, like I say, they first they, they uh, I, I was supposed to come in at 10 o'clock at night, and I was, Jesus, you know. So uh, I would climb in and out of the bedroom window, and uh, I don't recommend that if you're drunk. Um, they had a flagstone planter around the house. And uh, for almost three months, I didn't have any skin on my hips. I'd get one foot up in that damn window and one foot down, and Jesus, uh, where we went from there, nobody knew. And and uh, I fell a lot. So they moved me to the garage. And uh, Now, you know, most people don't know that uh, in California it gets cold. Now, if you've lived in a garage, you'd know that for sure. <laughs> and uh, and I was living out in that garage and, and uh, drinking wine by this time. So I drank an awful lot of whiskey in my life. But by this time, uh, the whiskey wouldn't stay down. Uh, I, I know that some of you never had that happen, but I did. Uh, I, couldn't, I couldn't even smell whiskey and uh, get the dry heaps. So uh, wine was my drink of choice, my drug of choice, you know. And I was drinking wine out in the garage, and I thought, Jesus, it's cold out here. I, I'm going to move back in the house. So I thought a good way to do that is I'd faint suicide. And I could, uh, you know how we are at script writing, you know. My dad would see me out there, my mom, and they'd go, oh, please don't kill yourself. Come on back in the house. You know, I wrote a good script. And, uh, so I decided the safest thing to do was to hang myself. I tried, uh, before that, I had tried rat poison, uh, potassium cyanide. And uh, I'll tell you what, um, I went into a convulsion, and when I came out of that, I think it was a day or two later, I needed a drink, you know. <laughs> Jesus. But anyhow, uh, the plan of action was suicide. So I couldn't find any rope, but I found some wire, and I made I made the 13 loops in the wire, and I got a box, and I put the box there, and threw this wire over the top. It didn't it look good, and but I made sure the box was good and sturdy. I didn't want any miscuing, you know, going on. 
And so I got up there and slipped it down and waited, uh, you know. Take it loose, go down, have a drink of wine. Get back up, slip it down again. Finally, I heard the door close. My dad, I could see him out the little bitty window in the door. And uh, he walked out there, and so I got up real quick, slipped it down, and just as he hit the door, I shook that box, you know. And he looked in, and he looked at that box, and he said, you're going to hang yourself. Well, go ahead, you son of a bitch. And he slammed the door and went back in the house again. (laughs) Jesus. So I got I got mad. And uh and uh and I got in show business. You know how we get in sh- I'll show them. You know how we get in show business? And I s- moved to the chicken house. Chicken house was a way on back. And it started to rain. And I'm I made a discovery. I discovered that there were other things in that chicken house besides chickens and me. There were little bitty critters about the size of a pinhead by the millions called chicken lice. And in the rain, they decided to move from the chickens to me. And I thought, oh, shit, I'm in DTs. My whole, my whole scalp was crawling. And I discovered that it wasn't DTs, that it was those little bitty critters. So I moved. I kind of went on the road, you know. They call it homeless now. It's kind of dignified. They called us bums in that, those that days, you know. And uh, I bummed on up to, uh, well, actually, Pat and I were in jail together, and we made this big decision that we were going to go to Oregon and become lumberjacks and uh, get healthy, you know. And uh, so we, we were in a Lidwood City jail, and uh, this old sergeant let us out same time early and we went down and I had an old Pontiac uh, you know a drunk car dents all over it you know shifted kind of funny and uh, we went down to the red white and blue which is a liquor store and got a pint of whiskey to get this you know thing going in the right direction and uh, headed for Santa Barbara uh, from down in Linwood which is 108 miles you know, actually, we were going to go to Oregon, but uh, it took us a year to get to Santa Barbara. <laughs> and uh, at that rate, seven years later, we'd have been in Oregon. But, uh, you know, by this time, I knew that the first drink gets me drunk. You know, I knew that. That wasn't news to me when I came to you people. I knew that. I just couldn't keep from taking that first drink. You know, page 24 of our big book describes it better than anything. It says that we will see that day when we have absolutely no defense against the first drink. You know, And I had absolutely no defense against the first drink. So I decided to sober up. And uh, uh, Pat was, uh, he was so hot, he left the United States. And I was just medium hot. And I went to Vegas to sober up, which will tell you a little bit about the keen alcoholic mind that I have. <laughs> I got a job at the Riviera Hotel as a busboy, and uh, I was good at it. I've always been good at anything I did. And uh, and I didn't drink for three and a half months, one day at a time. And I knew absolutely nothing about AA. In fact, I had made fun of AA, not knowing anything about it. I was pretty good at that, making fun of things that I knew nothing about. And uh, I had because that bar I had down in the British West Indies, I, I'd made a sign uh, for over the door, Alcoholics Unanimous, you know. And, uh, and I didn't know anything about you people. So I, I went to Vegas uh, to sober up, and three and a half months, I was walking across the casino floor one morning. I'll give you an example of how this thing worked with me. I was on my way to work. No big deal. 
No, nothing happened. I was just on my way across the casino floor. I had to walk past the corner of the bar. And I walked right up to the bar and said, give me a double shot. You know, I threw that down. That was about 1954, I think it was. I may miss it a little bit, you know. I didn't make it to work that day uh, or that week, or that month, that year. <laughs> Never made it to work. I think they may still owe me money. I'm not sure. <laughs> and uh, about a week later, I was hitchhiking to Los Angeles, drunk, sick, broke. The pony of wine, you know. Now here's, here's how my ego operates, okay? I was walking out of Vegas, out the strip, and the uh, strip in those days wasn't like it is today. Uh, there was a gas station out on the end where the railroad tracks are that the road goes over. And so I, I went into the gas station and I, oh, it was hot. Jesus, it was August. And, uh, this gas station tenant came out and he said, Jesus, man, what are you doing out in the sun? Uh, no hat. And I took one of my shoes off, shoved it up in his face, and I said, you see that? Florsham Shoe? I work for the Florsham Shoe Company. I'm a professional walker. I'm walking these shoes to Los Angeles. When I get to Los Angeles, I have a plane waiting for me to fly me to Anchorage, and I'm going to walk a pair of shoes to Fairbanks. I used to scare myself sometimes with what comes. <laughs> then, I, you know, then I took a drink of wine and went, "Whoa!" <laughs> but then a thought occurred to me. I had been hitchhiking right up to that gas station. Professional walkers don't hitchhike. So I walked out of there and walked down that road until I could look back over my shoulder and not see that gas station anymore. And then I started hitchhiking again. Here I was, worried about someone I had never seen in my life, probably will never see again, and yet I was worried about what he thought about me. You know? That's my kind of alcoholism. I ended up back in the VA hospital a couple of different times. Four times, I think. I'm not sure. Do you do you love your mother? Or would you rather go fishing again? And, and uh, the fourth time in there, I got a new psychiatrist. The old psychiatrist, he didn't want to talk to me anymore, and I don't blame him. You know, when they rolled me in, they used to roll me in horizontally because uh, by the time I reached them, I could not walk anymore. I would drink wine. The, the last time they rolled me in, I weighed 114 pounds. I was more dead than alive. And he looked down at me as they rolled me in the lock ward there, and he, his exact words were, Jesus Christ, are you here again? And what are you going to say? Rip you, you know. <laughs> I didn't do that. He just lay there and take it, you know. He had that look of disgust that we so often get. I did. And... uh and this new psychiatrist came up to me and he said, Otto, I'm going to have a couple of guys come in from Alcoholics Anonymous and I'd, I'd like you to spend some time with them. And I said, sure, be happy to. They had something I wanted and I was willing to go to any length to get it. Matches. Because <laughs> they, uh, they used to shut our fire off in the nut ward about nine o'clock at night. You know, they were afraid we might burn the place down, I guess. I don't know. But if we got to hold some matches, all the drunks... See, there's nothing new about drunks hanging out together. Jesus, we've been doing it for decades, centuries, you know. How many of you ever wasted the time sitting around with social drinkers? <laughs> Shit, Christ, I didn't. You know, take the cork off and throw it away, you know. <coughs> So we'd get matches, and we'd and and if if I if I had some matches, I'd show you a little trick. You, those of you who may want to go back out and drink again, you may need this trick. It's how to split matches so you can get about three matches off of one. You know, you can do that. And uh, a little pack of matches lasts you a long time in a nut house. You know, <laughs> just a side interesting thing, anyhow. <laughs> uh, 
So uh, I, I met with these two, two guys. Bob was a big man, sober one year. Jack was a little guy, sober five years. And they locked the three of us in a room together. And they talked to me. And at first, you know, I was a little paranoid. I thought, oh, shit. My doctors discussed my case with the, it's very obvious, you know. But then they started talking about things I hadn't told the psychiatrist. You know, I look back on that now, and this is a strange thing, that I wouldn't tell the psychiatrist everything because I thought if I did, he would think I was nuts. <laughs> and I'm in a goddamn nut house. <laughs> So these guys started talking about doing the kinds of things, feeling the kinds of ways that I did, feeling the way that I did when that psychiatrist looked down at me with those eyes and said, Jesus Christ, are you here again? You know, the way that that parents looked at me and loved ones looked at me and girlfriends. I, I never got married in all the time I was, I don't think anyhow, but... Uh, <laughs> Uh, because, well, I was on my way one time, but I left her at a bar somewhere, and I'll be goddamned if I could figure out what bar I left her at. <laughs> and so, anyhow, that was uh, in 1956, in March. And uh, I started to go to these meetings of yours. Uh, uh, you can set your watch by me. I all the meetings in the, in that area in those days in the L.A. area were 8.30 at night till 10 o'clock. They keep getting earlier. We got one at 5.30 in the morning of where I live. Christ, I'm not in bed at that time, you know. <laughs> but anyhow, uh, I would come late and sit in the back. And uh, when you guys got up to pray, I left. I didn't, wa I didn't want to talk about God. I was hoping there wasn't a God, you know. I was always taught a god of retribution, a scorekeeper, and my score was not good. And so I chose to ignore the whole thing, and I didn't want to talk about God, and and I, I didn't want to hear about it at all very much. And in those days, they didn't, they weren't into halos that much in those days, and uh, they didn't talk about spirituality as much. They talked about what it was like, what happened, and what it's like now in their lives. And I could see that. I could see that they were doing well in life. And I was not. And that's attraction we read here rather than promotion. They didn't try to promote me. I was, I was over at the hospital the other night. A guy was trying to promote me into sicking this guy. This guy was about as interested in Alcoholics Anonymous as he was a man in the moon. He couldn't wait to get out of the hospital to get another drink. And I said, shit, go at it. Here, call me when you get done, you know. But you guys had attraction for me. And uh, and I kept coming back. You said, keep coming back, and I did. Um, I'll never forget one time. And I hope we'd never get by this. I, I went to the hole in the ground, which was downstairs in Huntington Park. It's not there anymore. They closed it down about a year ago. I don't know how I got down the stairs. I was pretty drunk, but I did. And I came in right inside the back door, and I sat in one of those folding chairs. And when I did, I missed the damn thing. And I ended up on the floor, drunk. And I was so drunk I couldn't get up. And two guys came over to me, and they picked me up off the floor, and they put me in that chair. I was not a noisy drunk. I wasn't one of these guys who throws chairs around, you know. I, I was quiet. Because I, as feeble as I was, I recognized that you guys had something. And they put me in that chair, and one of them patted me on the shoulder, and he said, uh, you keep coming back. You'll make this son of a bitch yet. And I never forgot that act of kindness. I hope we never forget that in Alcoholics Anonymous and get too goddamn good for our own good, you know. But I kept coming back. And... Uh, and I'd been out on a drunk, not the worst drunk that I had been on in 1959, in August. And uh, I'd been on lots of horrendous drunks, Jesus, you know, where I've almost died. And uh, and I woke up in the back of a garage. Um, and uh, it was two days before my natal birthday. I'd, I'd started out celebrating my birthday uh, in July. Uh, and my birthday's in August. 
and uh, and I woke up two days before uh, my birthday, and uh, and I didn't want to drink anymore. And that thing, that thing, was removed. I've never had a conscious desire to drink since that morning, and uh, and I haven't had a drink since that morning. And I've never done dope. Oh well, I I did a little dope. Uh, the Veterans Administration is always trying to make me sleep more and happy. <laughs> now I don't know why. They want to give me sleeping pills and uppers. And uh, well, they gave me phenobarbital by the box uh, in the 1950s. That was their answer in those days. Later on, it was other stuff, but. Uh, and, and uh, I learned real quick that you don't uh, drink wine and take phenobarbital. Uh, you take about four phenobarbital and wash it down with red sweet wine, and you start losing things. You know, I lost Monday and Tuesday one time. Uh, Friday and Saturday another time. So I, I gave them to my mother. Uh, she. Uh, she it got her through menopause, you know. Uh, uh, and uh, I never was a speed uh, guy. I, I took a few whites and a uh, little dexedrine one time, but I didn't like what they did to me. Uh, it was just like going 90 miles an hour with one of your feet tacked to the floor. It was... Uh, uh, I didn't. I didn't like it. So I've never screwed around with dope, uh, and 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 don't today. Now I, I'm. You know I don't recommend to anybody what you should do. But uh, the fact that I want to take a drug to feel better is a danger signal to me. It's a danger signal. Here's what I do to feel better. It's right in this book. That's that's my uh, tranquilizer and sedating. <laughs> Pill. <laughs> I uh, thank you. <laughs> well, I'm glad you agree. There's probably a lot of people in here that don't. Anyhow, I uh, I stayed in the back of that garage for five or six days. I'm not quite sure, but uh, on Sunday I came out and uh, uh, I went down. I bummed a dime and called Alcoholics Anonymous in Long Beach. I still remember the telephone number, but I remember numbers very well. I retain a lot of numbers. Anyhow, I called and a, a gal by the name of Peggy McGee answered. And, a guy, and she sent a guy out. And we spent about three and a half hours in the back of that gas station. And it's strange, you know, when he came out, that by the time he came out, it was, uh, it was noon. And there was a lot of people walking around, but he drove right up to me and went like this, you know, and, uh, and I sat with him in his car, and he said, you want to go to a meeting tonight, and I said, oh, yeah, because I knew you guys had it, I knew you did, and, and, uh, and so he took me to this meeting in Compton, California, and I, I met that night the guys that I was to spend the rest of their lives with them. They're all gone now, but they uh, they were an example. You know, they didn't uh, talk to me about spirituality. They showed me about spirituality. They showed me about things that I didn't even know the meaning of. One word, I didn't even know the meaning of integrity. <laughs> and they they taught me what that meant by their actions not they didn't tell me verbally and uh, they they taught me what honesty meant i i was pretty honest uh uh money wise i wouldn't steal your money uh, you know i never was very good at that anyhow i'm a lot better at that sober <laughs> i don't have to anymore though but uh I'm like old Jack Baker, you know. Uh, Jack walked into a bank and uh, and wrote a note, "Give me all your money," and then signed it, Jack Baker, and handed it to him. <laughs> <laughs> the federal government didn't think it was that funny. He did three and a half years in Terminal Island for that little stint, you know. 
He didn't even get to the door. He was so drunk. So, anyhow, I uh, I got busy in Alcoholics Anonymous right away because in those there weren't any treatment centers. We didn't have treatment centers or detox centers. We had Lincoln Heights, which was a detox center. Uh, it was a drunk jail. You know, they didn't even have uh, felony tanks and uh, felony cells in Lincoln Heights. It was all drunk tanks and. Uh, overlooking beautiful Avenue 19. And and I was in there 27 times, so I know what I'm talking about. And uh, and they chained us together five at a time. And we went up uh, before Judge Clifton. We became friends. And uh, <laughs> and uh, he hurt my feelings once. Uh, I was up before him, and, and uh, he looked down at me, and he said, Otto, you're nothing but a common drunk. And I thought, you son of a bitch, you know. You get down here, let me up there. We'll see who's who. But I said, uh, yes, sir. You know, that's what I said. Because you don't want to make Judge Clifton mad. You always, always hoped when you were chained to these four other guys that uh, one of them wasn't still drunk enough to be smart. Jesus, you know. If he mouthed off to Clifton, you all went for 90 days, you know. <laughs> and uh, so, anyhow... Uh, I, I hung out with these guys that taught me how to be sober in life and, and uh, operate in the world. They came up, uh, I was sober uh, a few days, and, and uh, Gus came up and said, it's time you, go, time you went to work. Go get a job. And, and scared the shit out of me. And I, <laughs> I said, well, 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 where do I go? I, said, I didn't know, you know. He said, we're not an employment office. Go get a job. Okay, so uh, I went on up into L.A., I'd always wanted to work for this outfit. I'd worked for most every other outfit uh, in electronics, and, and I was good at what I did. Naturally, you know, have you, have you ever heard a drunk being bad at what he did? I haven't heard too many of them. Or a lazy drunk? Nah, we got a few of them around, but, you know, they're not alcoholics of my type anyhow. So I, I went up there at 740 South Olive, and I walked in there, and I said, need a job? They said, fill this out, filled it out. I said, go over here, take a test. I went over. I've always been good at tests. Doot, 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 doot. I was out having a cigarette while the rest of them were still taking a test. This guy came out, and he said, uh, you did well. Thank you. And I was still shaken. He said, uh, I'd like you to go up and take a physical on the second floor. And I thought, oh, shit. <laughs> oh, physical examination. So they took, I, well, hell, I needed a job. I went up there, stripped down. They put a little paper thing uh, over me, they opened in the back, and I sat on this cold x-ray table. Now, I'm already shaking, and now I'm cold and shaking. <laughs> I could have strung a, I could have strung a sewing machine needle while it was running, for Christ's sake. <laughs> and, and, and this Dr. Whitehead comes in, and he, uh, taps me here, taps me there, and, uh, first question. First question, how much do you drink? And I gave him an answer that was as honest as I possibly could be at the time. I said, I hope I don't drink at all. He says, I hope you don't either because I'm going to pass you on this test. <laughs> and so I got hired into Pacific Bell. And uh, a few days later, I was stringing wire for him. And, uh, and I, I was getting healthier all the time. I worked for that outfit for almost 30 years. Isn't that strange? And in 30 years, I missed work twice. <laughs> I, was, I wasn't trying to set out any record. I just, that's the way it ended up. You know, you'd be surprised you quit drinking wine, what'll happen. You, you, if you continue to drink wine, you'll be surprised at what happens. <laughs> Uh, one of these things that uh, Joe Leach and I have in common, I'll give you a little insight, <sighs> is one of the things that, uh, well, here's the deal. I got I got out of the nut house, and I went to work. I got paid $28. I don't know why I remember that, but I do. And uh, I thought, Jesus, i got to go buy some honey a drink. And so I got dressed up in a suit that had been gray, but now was a brownish gray. And uh, a nurse gave me a tie uh, when I got out of a nut house. I don't know why, but she did. And, and uh, I had a white shirt that was now gray, had a little bit of puke here, but that, I could cover that up. And, uh, 
and I went down. I think I was a brain surgeon that evening. I'm not sure. <laughs> but uh, I went down in the Lafayette Hotel lounge downstairs to impress some honey about brain surgery. And one of the things when you drink wine and smoke cigarettes, I smoked uh, three packs a day, uh, Pall Malls, and my fingers were kind of brown. And uh, one of the things that you want to avoid is sneezing or coughing. Figure it out. <laughs> so I was buying this honey a drink, and I started coughing. And some strange things happened. And what do you do? You can't stay there, and you can't leave. You know, talk about incomprehensible demoralization, I think, is a term that is used in Alcoholics Anonymous. The irony of the whole thing is that a few years later, in 1960, the International AA Conference was in Long Beach. And in that very lounge downstairs, right outside the cocktail lounge, I got to meet Bill Wilson because we were both sober members of Alcoholics Anonymous by then. So anyhow, I started going to these meetings and, uh, you know, I'm still a meeting goer. I still go to a lot of meetings. People ask me, why do, why do you go to a lot of meetings? And the answer that I have is very simple, is I like the outcome. I like the outcome. And so I, I went to work for that outfit, went back to school, and, uh, and uh, I became an engineer for that outfit and uh, a designer. And I was good at it, uh, as we all are. But without Alcoholics Anonymous and those guys, I know what would have happened. See, I see this all the time. And I, I love the people that are involved in it, but I've got a guy that had 12 years in this, in this deal. And he, and he, right now, he's in a treatment center again. See, he got, he went to school and, and I'm not against that. But he went to school and not AA. He gave up AA. Got too busy, you know, got too busy for this deal and uh, became a paramedic. Paramedics have access to all kinds of things. And that started him on the road. He's been out there two and a half years trying to get back into Alcoholics Anonymous and he ain't worth a shit yet. You know, but I talked to him this last week and it's all about him, all about him. And uh, I love the guy, but he may have to die of alcoholism, you know, if he doesn't get a change in his attitude. And so I keep going in this deal, and I learn from these guys. And we had more fun than the law allows. Jesus, if you're new if, and you think, well, life's over, da-da-da-da-da, you know, I'll tell you we have more damn fun. Ten of us it took to buy my first car. Ten guys. <laughs> yeah, two car loads. We go out over to Pasadena, and, and they said it's time. These guys said it's time you had a car. Oh, okay. I had a driver's license. I had it revoked forever in the state of California, but I had gotten it back. And I won't tell you how, because if you try it, you'll get caught. <laughs> but, but they said, you need a car to take new ones to meetings. I said, okay. So we went up to South Pasadena and this big place and he, and he had a, uh, I wish I had it today, a 1954 two door coupe. God, it was beautiful. And, uh, and he wanted a hundred dollars for it. And, uh, and ten of us guys dump into this guy's place and he says, uh, well, come on in and in the music room. If he knew what he had in his music room, Christ, he'd have had a nervous breakdown. But anyhow, we went out back, and they, these guys were kicking the tires and looking under the hood, and I'm just standing there. And uh, and old Gus went up. Gus always had snoofs in here, and uh, Gus went up and said, uh, "Will you take sixty bucks for it?" And the guy, by this time, he was pretty nervous. He said, "Yeah." <laughs> yeah. So I, I drove it off. I put sixty thousand miles on that car, hauling new ones to meetings. You know, a lot of them sobered up in the back seat of that car. Don Pila sobered up in the back of that car. And a few others. 
and uh, but we had more fun. The meeting before the meeting, the meeting after the meeting. I don't know. These people want to go home from the meeting anymore. They can't wait to get out of it. Jesus, we sat up till three o'clock, four o'clock in the morning, and went went on to work. You know, that's the way we we hung out together. We we hung on to one another. We were desperation. It will is a, you know, will make willingness, and uh, and so uh, I don't want to take up. I, boy, I don't want to take you guys away from your dancing because you'll start throwing books at me and. I, uh, I was up, I, I had, here's, God gives me little lessons. I, I told you that I didn't want to hear about God, and I didn't want to have anything to do with God. Well, there's been a transition over the years, and it's taken a long time. But see, here's the kinds of things that has happened over the years. And I'll tell you just this one story. I was a smart guy, even sober, you know. So one day on the way, I had an office in the Occidental Towers in, in downtown L.A. on the 22nd floor. And I was on my way into work. And there was a gal with a watchtower out on the corner, uh, a, a little ma and pa market there. And she was out there every morning. And I would see her. So one morning, I'm on by there, and I honk the horn, beep, beep, and I wave at her. I'm being smart. See? You know, my motives were wrong. I'm just being a wise guy. But then uh, I, I started doing that every morning. Honk, honk. Hi. And uh, pretty soon I found myself meaning it. I really did. It's good to see her there every morning. I don't know why that, that, took, that change took place, but it did. Honk, honk. Wait. One morning I went by, she wasn't there. I thought, shit, that's strange. And I went around the block and came back around again because I made, she went inside. She wasn't there. It's a Monday morning. And uh, Tuesday morning went by. Not there. Wednesday, not there. Thursday I went by and there she was. And I pulled into a parking place that I wasn't supposed to and and ran back to the corner. I scared the hell out of her. I ran up to her and I said, where the hell have you been? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I said, I, I missed, I couldn't believe what was coming out of my mouth. I said, I've missed you. And she said, well, I had the flu and I was very ill. And I said, are you all right now? She said, well, yes, I am. Thank you for asking. And I said, well, good. I hope you, you'll be out here every morning. First, she didn't recognize me. She went, what? And then she went, oh, yeah, you're the guy. <laughs> I, got up to, I got up to my office and I could look out over. And I, and I looked out there and I thought, Jesus, here is a gal who's standing out there every morning, rain or shine, you know, talking about her beliefs. And who am I, Jesus Christ, a drunk, you know, to put that down? God just kind of settled a lesson into me there. And that's the kind of things that have happened to me over the year. And now uh, God and I are in a mutual admiration society. Really? And uh, it's a pretty good deal. But anyhow, I was in my office one day, and a division guy uh, called me and said, I, I want to see you down in my office. And I thought, oh, Jesus, because you know, we've been stealing his car, and because uh, he had a stereo in it and a uh, company car. So I thought, he's gonna, you know, that's the deal. And uh, so he had a strange guy in the office, and uh, he introduced me to this Dr. Rufus Walker. And, and I said, he said, uh, Dr. Walker wants to talk to you for a little while. And I said, oh, okay. I said, what the hell is going on? So uh, my district guy, uh, my division guy left the office, and uh, this doctor said, I've heard about you. And I said, yeah. He said, uh, we're going to start a program uh, in the medical uh, department on alcohol and drug abuse, and we don't know anything about it. And we want to know if you would come in and help us out. I said, uh, well, what would I be doing? He said, well, you'd be talking to people uh, from all kinds of problems. But I said, well, shit, I'm not trained for that. He said, uh, you know, I said, I'm basic psych, but he said, no, we'll train you. Don't worry about that part. I said, well, i got to talk to my some people about this deal before I do it. So I called New York, asked them, can I do this? And they said, oh, yeah. 
You can do it. And they told me how to do it. And I went to these old boys, Gus Hood and Tex and Jack Underwood, and, and I asked them, can I, can I do this thing? And old Jack just, Jack kind of narrowed it down. Jack was a man of few words. Big man. Jesus, he was this big. He said, uh, are you going to be able to help people there? And I said, well, Jack, I think I will. He said, well, and isn't that what this deal teaches us to do? And I said, well, I think so. So I went back and told them that I would join their staff in the medical department, and I spent 11 years in there. And uh, they sent me back to school again, and I uh, got a, another thing for my wall, and and uh, I was able to, you know, it's kind of ironic uh, that uh, I got to work with that guy that... Uh, that doctor that asked me that first question, how much do you drink? I was working with him. And uh, and then uh, I, I I went 11 years in there. And I helped as many people as I possibly could, honestly, you know. And then there came a time when I had to help myself because I couldn't help anybody anymore. And I had to leave there. And I was very fortunate because uh, I had a good reputation in the company and... Uh, and uh, this guy, you know, I went, I, I had to leave. I told him I had to leave the medical department for my own safety. And uh, I went up to a guy that I knew, and he said, uh, you can have any job in the company you want. I already had one picked out ahead of time. And so I spent the last uh, years uh, of my tenure with uh, Pacific Bell uh, in fiber optics and digital radio and uh, as a manager. And I retired. And uh, you know what? I like retirement. <laughs> I retired in 1987. Been retired since then. But I, but I, uh, I, I love doing things. Uh, I told you that I have a relationship with a God, and and I do. See, God and I had a long talk, and uh, and uh, God doesn't have any hands and no feet. Can't get around too much. Gets around, but not, he can't kick. And, uh, and so I do his work for him. And that's what I do. Uh, I, I'm, I love, I have my own cement mixer. Love it. Jesus, you know. I wear it out and get a new one. You know. Uh, I'm liable to lay cement over your lawn if you don't come out in a hurry. Uh, I build stuff for people and uh, in Alcoholics Anonymous, and uh, and I love doing it. Uh, what a what a deal for a, a drunk like me, you know, that I'm able to live in this world. And and I've got a wonderful partner. We've been together uh, quite a few years, and uh, I was I did get married uh, after I got sober, and it, it lasted for 15 years, and then we broke up. And I had children, and Mary Ann had children. So we have five children, and we have 14 grandchildren. And uh, and that keeps us pretty busy, let me tell you. Right now we're planning a, a cruise for the whole bunch of us. And uh, and we had a family reunion last week uh, or last year over at the beach, and we had a, uh, all of the kids, none alcoholic. I don't know what the hell happened. Male mailman might have got in on this deal. I don't know. <laughs> but, None of them, none of them are alcoholics or dopers. They're all hardworking kids, and uh, and uh, we're on our way up north. We're going to go see one of them, and and a couple of granddaughters that we have, and uh, and I love those kids. See, I could take you through the raising of those children sober. You know, I I took my the boys through the Indian guides, and I hell I was a chief, you know, but naturally, and. Uh, <laughs> And uh, my daughter was in the Bluebirds, and I was their chauffeur, you know, because I'm sober. And uh, when we went out, my daughter was in school. I'll never forget. We used to go TP houses together. I'd go with them. And I'd always take a new guy. Watch watch a new guy TP a house. Jesus, they're quick. I'll tell you. Yeah. Take, yeah. Take a new guy with you. And, and uh, I did. And... Uh, I, I have memories locked in my, my head from uh, like this. I had two boys on in high school football, okay? Uh, Jody was number one, okay? Tony was number 58. And so they have, they have this father-son night where 
the dad goes down in the field halftime, and the and the the boys spring out one through how many seventy some. And and uh, you go down on the field, and and uh, the boy takes off his jersey and puts it over his dad, you know. And then they say your name. And uh, Jody was number one, so I would go down and stand in front of Jody, and Jody would take off his jersey, and then then I'd run down the field. They'd say there goes Otto down the field, and I'd stand in front of Tony. And then when it got down to 58, Tony would take his off and put his over the number one that I had on. And I'll remember that the rest of my life, you know. I remember uh, my little granddaughter, uh, McKenna Cheyenne. I'm going to see her in a couple of days here. She's this big now. But when she was little, uh, I, I'm, I'm a fair skater. I was on ice for a long time, and then I roller skates too. But I was teaching uh, this little, and she has hair that goes in 48 directions. God, all over, you know. <laughs> Cuter than a bug's ear, naturally, you know. And... and uh, and I'm skating backwards, and, and I, I have a hold of her. And, and I skate a little while, and then pretty soon I just slowly release her, and she's doing this kind of, you know. And I'll remember that the rest of my life. The wonderful memories that I have because of you, see. Uh, I owe everything to Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, uh, Dr. Bob, they asked him one time, why do you do this? Why do you spend your time going out? and talking to new guys, and uh, carrying the message. And and it's on page 181 if you want to look at it. And the first thing, the number one is, he says, I do it because of sense of duty. You know? Sense of duty. And that's what these guys that I got sober with taught me in this thing. I have a sense of duty to this thing. Not up here, Jesus. I'm... I'm not that good up here. There's a lot of more entertaining speakers than me. I'm at my best one-on-one -on -one with some guy that smells like I did. You know, that's when I'm at my best. But I have a duty to this thing. And, uh, and I, I better end pretty soon here. Yes, I, I better. I'm going to tell you a story, and then I'll get the hell out of your hair, okay? <laughs> the story is this. There was a kid walking down the block, and he came to a vacant lot. And he looked at the lot, and he went next door, and he knocked at the door. And the uh, guy came to the door, and he said, yeah? The kid says, is that your lot out there? And the guy said, yeah. He said, you mind if I make a garden out there? And the guy said, geez, look out there. It's crash and tires. And the kid said, I don't care. You mind if I make a garden out there? And the guy said, sure, go ahead. So the kid worked hard. You know, cleared it off and tilled the soil and planted seeds and pretty soon, Jesus, you know, beautiful garden. And he was standing out in front one day and the priest from down the block, the parish down the block, came by and looked at the garden, looked at this kid. And he said, uh, is that your garden, young man? The kid said, yes, Father, it is. He said, that's a wonderful garden that you and God have growing there. And the kid looked the priest in the eye and he said, Father, you should have seen it when God had it all by himself. <laughs> so if you want your field to grow, do something about it. It's in this book and in the meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous. I love you and God bless you. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.